the fact is that organisms are never perfectly suited to their environment. The way evolution works is through a whole series of compromises and jury-rigged solutions based on what was there before. Hi, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer for Reason TV, and today we're talking with Marlene Zook. She's an evolutionary biologist at the University of Minnesota and the author of the new book, Paleo Fantasy. Marlene, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me. The idea of a paleo diet and mimicking the caveman-like lifestyle has picked up a lot of steam lately, and you're saying the basis for these ideas is missing the mark. So could you go into that a little bit and some of the evolutionary examples that support this? I've gotten really interested in the last few years in how much we now can understand about the rate of evolution. And it turns out that we now can understand that evolution acts quickly under some circumstances and slowly under others. And that then made me interested in this whole idea that humans are mismatched with their environment because we evolved under a certain set of circumstances that we've now deviated from and so therefore we're in bad shape because we're not eating the way people did a hundred thousand years ago we're not interacting with each other the way people did a hundred thousand years ago we're not exercising the way we did a hundred thousand years ago and so forth and I think that that idea just overlooks a lot of really cool stuff that's been happening in evolution. One of your points is that the cavemen had a lot longer time to adapt to their surroundings than we have to modern life with cities and our environment. So, so how, how does this play a role? It's absolutely true that our bodies didn't evolve under circumstances where we had television and lots of calorie-rich but nutrient-poor food. But at the same time, talking about life 100,000 years ago like it was completely static or like it was the same all over the world doesn't reflect reality either because things were changing then as well. So I think we tend to have nostalgia about lots of things, whether it's our own childhoods or life in the 1950s or you know maybe life in the Stone Age. But the fact is that organisms are never perfectly suited to their environment. The way evolution works is through a whole series of compromises and jury-rigged solutions based on what was there before. And it's not like organisms evolve evolve, evolve, and then get to a point and go, oh, phew, we've now done it, we're perfect, everything is exactly in tune with the environment and we can now stop, and anything that happens that moves us off this peak is going to be to our detriment. And that wasn't true 100,000 years ago, and it's also not true now. So you wouldn't say that technology has outpaced us as far as evolving biologically? The question of the degree to which you can separate our biology from our culture is something that anthropologists and biologists have talked about for a long time, and I don't think it's an easy one. I don't think you can put them into to these separate bins. We can demonstrate that the genes have, to be able to digest dairy have actually changed extremely recently over the last five to seven thousand years. So that when people started cultivating cattle, they were able to use milk as a source of both nutrients and potentially as water. This is what uh, some people have suggested that the selection was not just to use the nutrients in milk, but because it's an uncontaminated source of fluid, which can be in short supply depending on, on your environment. People who happened to have a genetic variant that allowed them to digest milk past weaning survived and left more copies of their genes. Herding cattle is a part of our culture. It's a behavior. So did that technology outpace what people were able to eat? Well, not really. It evolved together with it. You can argue that the iPad is maybe a little bit faster than cattle herding in that regard, but it's a matter of degree rather than kind. And so I think you want to be careful about separating this out and saying, oh, we've somehow got this primordial human that could exist independent of technology or culture or whatever you want to call it because humans don't work that way. We're, we're intertwined with our culture and it's part of us. Are we still living in a society that's built on survival for the fittest? And if you had to guess, what would be the next step for us? So I think the question about the next step is one that assumes something about evolution that isn't actually the case, namely that we're going somewhere. And so one of the things that I often have a hard time getting across is that evolution does proceed in sort of fits and starts and it'll depend on the environment that we're in. So predicting this is, it's almost like, oh, we'll predict where we're going next suggests that, well, step one's followed by step two, followed by step three, and then eventually we're gonna end up as like giant brains in jars or you know whatever the science fiction has. And, there's no reason to think that that's going to happen. I always see those cartoons of 
you know, the, the fish morphing into the amphibian that then crawls onto the land and then, you know, the reptile standing on four legs and then you have, you know, usually the, the monkey and, you know, then eventually the person. It's such a misrepresentation for the way evolution actually works, which isn't progressing toward anything. Amphibians weren't trying to become people and we're not trying to become brains in jars. Uh, well, Marlene, thanks so much for talking to us. Sure, yeah, this is fun. For Reason TV, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer.